So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our fourth Global Futures Lecture this semester with Dr. Koshik Basu, the Chief Economist of the World Bank, on the topic, Development Economics, the Big Open Questions. This is, as many of you know, Dr. Basu's second lecture in this series. In February, you shared with us some ideas about global uh, economic trends and their current and future significance. And the series has also included lectures by World Bank Group President Jim Young Kim, one on pandemics and one on climate change and ways the global community can work to overcome it. All four lectures and the conversations we've had, like the conversation we'll have after this lecture today, have really given us a great opportunity to think through the future of global development from a range of topical and analytical perspectives. Now, the Global Futures Initiative as a whole, which, which President DeJoya announced in January, is an invitation to members of our Georgetown community to undertake innovative research and teaching around critical emergent issues and to engage in dialogue, like today's, with world leaders in the public sector, business, and civil society. We've begun this semester with the topic, the global future of development. Next semester, we'll be looking at the global future of governance, and then at security and the environment. Now, when we think of great global universities, we think of far-flung campuses overseas, and we think of a rich and diverse international student body, and of course, we think of academic excellence around global issues. And Georgetown has all of those. Global Futures is an effort to build on those strengths, but also on something else, a location and an identity that together really sets us apart. Because of where we are in Washington, D.C., and who we are, a Catholic and Jesuit institution open to other religious and philosophical traditions, we're very well positioned to convene structured global conversations that address both practical questions of power, interest, and survival, and ethical imperatives of justice, peace, and the global common good. Just one way here at Georgetown we seek to live out our mission as an engaged global university in service to the wider world. The topic of global development, so critical now as the global community reflects on the post-2015 development agenda, is one of our emergent institutional strengths here at Georgetown within our undergraduate program, our doctoral program, but also through the growth and flourishing of three new master's programs, or rather two new master's programs, one in the School of Foreign Service, the Global Human Development Program, one in the McCourt School of Public Policy, our Master of International Development Policy, and one long-standing development program, the international track of our Master of Science in the Foreign Service Program. Now, we're grateful to the faculty and students from those programs for being here, to everyone else here in Copley Hall, to those of you joining us online via webcast and via Twitter. You can see our hashtag here, GU Global Futures. And we've also got about 40 bloggers from around the world helping to deepen the conversation this semester around our themes on the Global Futures website. It's now my pleasure to again introduce Dr. Koshik Basu, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank. Dr. Basu is on leave from his position as Professor of Economics and the C. Marx Professor of International Studies at Cornell University. A leading and distinguished scholar, he's also spent time at Harvard, at Princeton, and at the Delhi School of Economics, and has served in a number of important policy roles, including as Chief Economic Advisor in his native country, India. He's also well known as a columnist and as author of several influential books, including, most recently, Beyond the Invisible Hand, Groundwork for a New Economics, published by Princeton University Press in 2011. Since taking on his current role some two and a half years ago, Dr. Basu has been one of the drivers behind the bank's ambitious agenda to eliminate extreme poverty and promote shared prosperity in the decades ahead. We're really delighted you can be with us again here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Koshik Basu. Professor Tom Banchoff, 
students, faculty, friends. I also see a segment of the World Bank here. So to all of you, thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, for the um, lecture today. Pleasure for me to give my second lecture. And more generally, for this initiative and with the World Bank to work together and your particular series of lectures on the global futures uh, involving development economics, which is what we do at the World Bank. My last lecture uh, was on broad macroeconomic themes. I started with economic thought in the area of development from Adam Smith to contemporary times to the works of uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Amartya Sen and others. I talked about broad global trends, trends in poverty, trends in terms of shared prosperity areas where the World Bank has been engaged in and some very contemporary policy challenges. What's happening in Europe? What are the risks in the world? Today, my plan is to turn to something much more micro-theoretic. The big topics, the big open questions that we talk about today will be actually two big open questions. Today's lecture will be based on, based on or related to more correctly, two world development reports of the World Bank. One which is written and published, one which is at a very early stage. We've just thought a little bit about it. The first one is on social norms, mind, behavior, so sort of yeah, intersection of uh, sociology and uh, uh, psychology. And the second one on governance and the law. So the second topic that you see over there, that's the World Development Report on which we've just announced that uh, governance and the law as the next World Development Report. It's at a very early stage. I'll give you some rather flaky ideas about directions in which uh, we could go with that topic and some feedback will be very uh, useful. The other one, the first one is something that we have already worked on and there is a report out there. If you haven't seen it, you should get hold of the report and spend time on that. A lot of economics is uh, written with the rational actor in the background, that individuals are fully rational agents. And I should warn you that rationality is not defined in a trivial kind of way as whatever you do is rational. Some people fall into that trap that whatever people do is rational behavior. If that is your definition of rationality, then to say that human beings are rational is saying absolutely nothing because whatever you do, you're rational. So to be rational, you can do whatever you want to do. Economics does not make that mistake. There are certain attributes to what human rationality is, that you are acquisitive, you like to acquire more wealth, you like greater income. There are some attributes we write down, and you're pursuing that is the rationality assumption. M much of traditional development economics has worked with that assumption. And uh, from right from actually Adam Smith, it builds up to contemporary times, and if you're thinking of actually the works of Stiglitz and Amartya Sen, a uh, lot of this work is very critical of the mainstream, but in a very important way, these works belong to the mainstream. They make use of these fundamental assumptions and take the discipline further forward. And there's no getting away that this has really enriched our view, understanding development, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And a lot of the issues that I was talking about last time, the big macroeconomic challenges, doing your macro monetary policy right, doing your fiscal policy right, those are extremely important. And a lot of the mainstream of development economics has been concerned with this. But today I'm moving away from that to other drivers of development. We seldom talk about it because we take this for granted, but among the other drivers of development, are things like human psychology, way we think, the way we take decisions, our little irrationalities. Human beings have not only irrationalities, but some systematic irrationalities. So we will go into that and then law and uh, then governance and institutions is what I will go into after that. 
this is a topic that I got interested in, uh, the social norms and the role that they play in human development before coming to the World Bank and before actually working on this World Development Report. Working is too strong a word. There's a team that worked on it. I was tangentially involved, but before being involved in this. I got interested in this very early in my career from some field work that I used to do in, from Delhi, going into eastern India in the state of Bihar, which is in terms of per capita income and development, actually one of the relatively disadvantaged states in India. And the rural area that I would go into, this was really, in many ways, uh, that uh, relations of um, business, practice, etc., would be very primitive in this rural area. Being there and interacting with people, you pick up on the irrationalities and the social norms which drive human beings, which living in your own surrounding, you would not be aware because you typically share those irrationalities. The people that I live with, I interact with, we all have some very similar irrationalities. So they don't even appear irrational to you. It's only when you interact with people who are very different that you suddenly wonder, how did this person think like this? And you begin to question yourself. In fact, every time I pause and think, I, I do believe I'm a totally rational human being. I have to, uh, it it's, uh, sounds uh, a bit pompous, but deep down, it's just honesty, I feel I'm totally rational. But there is another sense in me which says that that can't be. I mean, that's not true for any human being. So even though I feel I'm totally rational, I'm sure I'm not. And when you see other people making irrational decisions, that you become convinced that there are lots of human irrationalities. And though I do believe I'm totally irrational, there's another sense in me which says that it must be I'm also irrational. And there are, my irrationalities are not quite as transparent to me. In this rural Indian setting, one which would uh, come up all the time, actually chatting with uh, these villagers, a money lender that goes up to a villager and explains fully and offers a credit. If the money lender said that I'm going to charge you 230% per annum interest rate compound, you explain it fully, or 10% per month. These two are virtually the same. 10% per month when you compound it comes to a bit more than 230. A villager will almost never take the 230% uh, um, loan at that. And the 10% per month they will more likely to take, it sounds much more attractive. 10% per month is not that much, but actually it works out to 234 or something when you compound it over 12 months. And you don't have to cheat these people. You tell them what it is, 10% per month compounded. If you don't pay back, yes, that will go into the pool of your debt. Interest rate will be charged. But 10 sounds so much better that people can't make this correction in their head. We have, uh, 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 human beings have regular problems about decision making over time. We know of accounts of this, one of the best accounts, which actually got me interested in behavioral economics um, intellectually, was George Akerlof, who has this paper in American Economic Review, where he says that he wanted to mail a parcel from India. He was in India at that time, mail it to the US. And every morning he would wake up and think that, you know, taking it to a post office, standing in a queue, Indian post offices can be slow. Uh, I don't want to do it today. I'll do it tomorrow, I'll send the parcel. And apparently for three months, he did not send the parcel. Finally, it went with him. And in this paper, Akerlof writes that if on the very first day, he knew that it's either today or three months later, he would have sent it that day. But that little postponement that he could do one day at a time led to an irrationality in the sense even in terms of his own preference. In retrospect, he felt he had done something wrong. Big literature on this, on human propensity to procrastinate. And this relates also to things like uh, dr uh, drug addiction. I mean, you feel that one more day, it's you know easiest. I have another smoke or whatever it is, indulgence that you have, and I'll stop tomorrow. And tomorrow it is, I'll stop tomorrow. And this very often continues. These things abound in human beings and the private sector has made use of this. When you are selling a product, you're not just trying to improve the product and get the quality to top speed. You're not just trying to lower the prices to make it attractive. Yes, you're working on those fronts, but you're also thinking, how are you going to place the product so that people believe it is better than it is? Or 
take advantage of some of the human frailties of the human mind and present the product in such a way that they are more likely to pick up. One example, which actually earlier in the discussion when we were working on the World Development Report, I, was, uh, I would bring up one very standard technique which is used and which earlier before I read up, I used to get puzzled about is when you are entering a store, for instance, in the US, say, to buy a refrigerator, very often, uh, right at the beginning, you'll see a spectacularly good refrigerator. You'll feel like buying it. But the price will be so high, you wonder whether it's worth it. It's crazy. No, you won't buy. In fact, the price is so high that probably no one will ever buy it. But what happens is after that, when you go in and you see similar refrigerators with a slightly lower price, you're much more likely to buy because that entrance experience at the entrance changes your reference point of prices. And the store knows that they'll never sell this refrigerator, but it just changes your reference point, and you're more likely to buy the next one that you see. This is a technique that is used. Variety of techniques get used. And we just felt that it was time that we use some of these things in the context of development by development practitioners. And that's what led to the World Development Report of 2015, which it came out in 2014, which is what we always do, end of 2014 report, is called 2015, on mind, society, and behavior. <laughs> this was drawing on relatively new research from around the world. There was earlier, as I said, from Adam Smith to contemporary writers, human beings are treated pretty much as rational, and that serves a purpose. We've run models with that. There are a few writers in the past who have veered out of that, Thorstein Veblen, uh, wrote famously about uh, human foibles of the mind, uh, the emotions like envy, jealousy, and the roles they play, but you know, very few uh, people like that. Um, uh, and he had great, actually, empathy for human beings. Veblen, he wrote with that empathy. He had empathy for human beings, but didn't really like human beings too much. Apparently, uh, for his students, his office hours, uh, per week began at one and a half hours and then the time kept shrinking and in the end he used to have five minutes a week of office hours for students. So he wanted to really minimize interaction with students. So it was at an intellectual level he engaged very well with human beings but directly I don't think he much cared for that. But Veblen wrote about this but we knew about his writings. The leisure class is uh, very, an expression that we use today but there was no systematic research. Now there is a whole lot of systematic research. I'll give you little glimpses uh, of this uh, uh, in a moment. But I, at times we do overdo these experiments and results also, I should tell you, though I've been involved in some of this, um, tangentially but involved. Many of these things we know in advance. So it's not that each time you get a new result, you uh, make a lot of effort, go to a village, you collect evidence. That isn't a big surprise. But there is an occasional finding which is a surprise. And it is one of those which got me very early interested in this topic. And that was a paper by one of the two directors of the World Development Report, Carla Hoff. Carla Hoff and a one-time student of mine called Priyanka Pandey had done these studies in India, which till I saw the results, actually, I didn't believe. For a long time, I didn't believe. So I actually, in this case, I needed a formal study to believe in the result. The result was the following. They went into uh, this village in uh, Uttar Pradesh, again, a, a relatively backward area in India, and went into fairly deep interior uh, um, uh, rural India. In this village school, they wanted to children to take IQ tests. These were very simple IQ tests, sort of mazes where you have to travel from one end to the other, how quickly you do, and things like that. Now, what they did was, first, you get the children together in a classroom, read out their names, nothing about their background or their identity. In India, as you probably know, especially in rural India, the caste identity is an important identity. And it's an identity which very often comes with a baggage. People expect you to do worse if you are from a backward caste. So what they first did is that these children are got together, no mention of their identity, and they are made to take these IQ tests. The performance is almost identical between the uh, upper caste uh, children and the backward caste children. Uh, IQ is statistically indistinguishable. There are some differences, but you can't distinguish uh, uh, statistically. Now, you do another round of tests, and they did these several times, where when you're reading out the name of the kid, 
you mention the caste of the kid. I should just tell you that in India, this is not such a politically incorrect thing to do. I mean, in, in villages, they will openly talk about it. But, and for that reason, I thought it won't have too much of an effect. So everyone in the class knows the caste of each kid, and the kid knows that the teacher knows uh, the kid's caste. After that, you make them take these IQ tests, and the backward caste children, their performance just drops. This switches on something in the brain. And to me, it's a very disturbing result. I mean, it's, it's not something you wish the world wasn't like that, that there are human beings who feel so discouraged by a statement of their identity that it changes their performance. And it does. And there are studies were done repeatedly. There are other studies which have been done elsewhere. Actually, one of the most famous studies, which was before Carla's work, was in the United States. This is the Harvard psychology study, where Asian women being made to take math tests repeatedly drive in women, and their math performance goes worse, remind them Asians, and there is the stereotype of the maths being an important subject there, their math performance improves. And this is once again a stereotyping. And in the caste case, where the caste comes with so much baggage, it's a very tragic one. There are other studies done in South Africa, blacks and whites, where of course it's visible. But if you prime them with conversation about race before you make them take tests, it begins to differ. This is one example of uh, the human mind uh, functioning in strange ways, and it sort of underwrites a lot of this report. Let me give you a quick little uh, example of uh, the, how the, uh, uh, the human mind uh, plays out, and then I'm going to go in. Before that, let me tell you one, uh, this is not in the report, but um, from an economist's point of view, this sounds like a bit of a facetious example, but an example to me which just sort of clinches the argument that human social norms, social psychology, these things are very important about how society performs. One of the fundamentals of development and growth is trade and exchange. We wouldn't be where we are if we had to produce everything that each person consumes. It is because we trade and we exchange that society has progressed. In Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which I talked about last time, this was one of the most important things, actually, apart from the invisible hand. It's a specialization which allows society to progress. And if you just pause and think of the specialized world that we live in, it's really just breathtaking. Most of us do things, just one thing, by which we would not be able to survive. It's just that we trade this off and then buy food and clothing. We don't produce any of these things that we survive. And this has given us huge efficiencies. So trade and exchange, that's the crux. What leads to trade and exchange? Take a microeconomics textbook, very mainstream microeconomics textbook. It will write down some axioms that lead to trade and exchange. Those axioms are important. I can tell you very quickly what these axioms are. Number one, that people prefer more to less. You want more, otherwise, I mean, a lot of society would not function. Number two, what in economics is called the law of diminishing marginal utility, is if you have more and more of one good, the additional utility that you're getting from that begins to go down. If you've had six apples, well, by the sixth one, you feel like throwing up, but if you had two apples, the second apple's utility will be less than the first apple's, third will be even less, etc. it goes down. These two assumptions, and the third one is if to start with, endowments are asymmetric. Someone has all the apples, someone has all the rice. Uh, one country has all the oil, another country has all the iron ore. These three conditions, if they are true, uh, more is preferred to less, diminishing marginal utility, and asymmetric initial distribution of endowments, there will be trade and exchange. And microeconomics textbooks run on that. There have been experiments done on rats, and that they like more to less is usually taken for granted. You see them scurrying around all the time trying to uh, get more food. The Law of Diminishing Marginal Utility is a published paper. Uh, four researchers, uh, University of Austin, Texas, ran experiments with rats, a very convincing experiment, where it is established firmly that rats also have suffer from the suffer or enjoy the laws of diminishing marginal utility. As you give more and more cheese to a rat, it will make less effort to get to the next piece. So the utility from cheese goes down. So two conditions are satisfied. And the Swedish economist Karl Warnerid 
reports of an experiment that was done where economists want to, wanted to see whether rats perform trade and exchange or not. So what they did was you put, put one rat in one corner, another rat in another corner, give one rat all the bread and another rat all the cheese, and then you want to see whether there is trade or not. And the research apparently read to the conclusion that there is no trade and exchange. <laughs> now, I would not waste my time doing that research. That's what I mean, a lot of the research. But that's what they did, and that's what they found. Put all these things together. Rats prefer, prefer more to less. They have diminishing marginal utility. They do not perform, even if you have initial endowment lopsided, one gets all the cheese, the other gets all the bread, they will not do trade and exchange. And that immediately alerts you to the fact that these three axioms are important, provided a whole lot of other social axioms are in place, which we take for granted. Human beings need to talk for trade. Language is important. Anthropologists have written about dumb barter, very rudimentary barter. You go and put a sack of something, one tribal group does, another tribal group comes and places a box of something else, but nothing much more. You need language. You need a bit of a regard for the other person. In the case of the rats, they were snatching the other person's food even before guarding your own. So you need a regard for another person's property, for instance. Whole lot of this cannot be policed. You can't bring in a third rat to police these two and say that everything will be fine. It won't. You need certain norms into the human head. And human beings have these norms, which is what makes a lot of economic life possible. But this takes you to a slightly politically incorrect conclusion that all societies may not have all the norms in place for more sophisticated trade, for more sophisticated exchange. Some societies have that, some societies don't. And societies that have that do manage to develop more and better. Francis Fukuyama talks at length about the trust among human beings being very important. And on trust, it does differ across societies. Anonymously, how much will you trust another human being? In some societies, a lot. In other societies, very little. And this has nothing to do with genetic hardwiring of human beings. This is to do with your own history, experience. Have you been subject to colonial exploitation, which has put your mind in a particular way? A lot of those things matter. And I feel in the end, it's nothing else but the history of the society that determines this. But the fact is that there are these differences across societies. And depending on how these differences work out, some societies do better and some societies do worse. And this is the broad area into which we are coming in to do research. Let me just show you one or two pieces of the role of psychology in perception in decision making and things like that, which are there in the report or certainly was there at some stage when the report was being written. So I don't even know whether this particular picture is there. This one I like very much because uh, you probably won't see it there, so I'm going to show you for a moment. We all know what chessboards are, so you know the black and white order. So therefore, it's very easy to misread this. Let me see. Well, yeah, this particular square and this particular, call that A, I don't know if you can see the A written on that, and call this one B. Since this is white, black, black, white, uh, white, black, white, most people feel that this B is lighter than this A. Just look at the A and the B, B will appear lighter than the A. If it is not appearing lighter than the A, you are a phenomenal person. <laughs> to most of us, and I know the answer, but still, the B is lighter than A. But if I could cover up the surrounding area and just show you a bit of the A and a bit of the B, they are actually absolutely identical. There's no difference. But the human mind picks up your prior knowledge of chessboards. It picks up the surrounding shades. And even when you know that they are the same, till you actually cover it up, and you can take hard copies of this later if you want to try this out, it's very difficult to see that the mind is being deluded. And there are famous artists who have used this to create phenomenal pictures. M.C. Escher is the most famous. The Swedish artist Reuters Bard creates all kinds of paintings where you get a big surprise about what it's trying to show. So it's illusions like this that the mind suffers from. Psychologists have known for a long time, but these are coming into economics. Let me show you another one which is, says a very different thing, but which plays a very important role and more important than the World Development Report actually talks about. I think you can take this further. This one is about organ donation. 
Um, the level of organ donation in the sense that you write down and say that I'm willing to donate my organ in the event of an accident. The seven countries on the right, starting from Austria and going up to Sweden, all of them, organ donation is more than 85% of the people donate their organs. If you take the left-hand side four, which is, uh, starts with Germany at the right-hand end, 12%, these four countries, all of them less than 27, 28%. No one gives more. In fact, if you compare two adjacent countries over there, Austria and Germany, very similar in many ways. In Austria, organ donation is 99.8%, so basically 100%. In Germany, it is 12%. And what is it? Is it that there's a price attached to the organ donation? Is it something else that you're taught about this in school? The answer is no. The default option in these two countries, Austria and Germany, are different. If you say nothing when you get a driving license, you are giving your organ in uh, Austria. In Germany, if you say nothing, you are keeping your organ after you die. To do the otherwise, uh, the other, you have to put a tick mark. It's made available to you, but whether you'll put that tick mark or not is the only difference. People go for the default option very, very often. So this leads to a big literature. The World Development Report talks about this, and recently there is a very nice paper by Ariel Rubinstein pointing to the fact that human beings take lots of decisions without a moment's thought without deliberation. It's an automatic decision making. And this one is automatic decision making for lots of people, so they don't think. Once you're given a choice, you go for the default. Life is full of that. The important thing, which we have to now go into beyond the World Development Report, is to realize that actually there is a good reason for it. It's not just irrationality. You can't leave this as an irrationality that you don't deliberate on your choices. There are certain choices in life which you if you think of the total number of choices in life that you have to make, there are just so many that if you pause and deliberate on each one of them, in the end you'll run out of time to take your, uh, make your choices through deliberation. Every time you're stepping out, do you start with your right foot or your left foot? Thousands of things you can think of, you're taking decisions. And we've cast a whole lot of them to automatic decision, you don't even think. In United States, I like to believe that virtually anyone, when you get into a, say, a bus or a metro, uh, whether to pinch another person's pocket and steal the wallet or not, you don't even think about it. There are some economists who believe that we don't steal other people's wallets by doing cost-benefit analysis of whether it's worth stealing, you might get caught or not. I don't believe in that for a moment. Also, I'd feel very uncomfortable if, if I believed in that, that everyone in the metro is doing quick calculations whether to pinch my pocket or not. I like to believe that that's a default decision that they are taking, that you don't even think about it. It's an automatic decision. You don't pinch other people's pockets. What in which society has been cast into automatic decision and what in which society you think and deliberate about makes a big difference to the functioning of a society. And there's nothing right or wrong about this. It is just that depending again on the society's history, background, people deliberate over various things. In India, where, when I'm in India, when I see a queue, the first thought is where can I cut into the queue? So I'm looking for gaps because it's a fair game. It's understood that it's a part of human utility maximization that you'll cut into the queue. One. Um, Upshot of that is Indian queues are awfully jammed. People sort of push into you because no one wants to leave a gap because they know that people standing around are all making rational calculations. <laughs> but at one level, this is like a shopkeeper here who when setting the price and customers are coming, will do a rational calculation. What's the highest price I can charge of this customer? There's nothing right or wrong, but there are certain things which help society to function better, certain things which don't help society to function better. Respect for the queue, I think, would help society to function better, but there's nothing morally right or wrong, just like there's nothing morally right or wrong about raising prices. Well, raising it too much is probably uh, morally wrong, but within limits, there's nothing right or wrong about them. Uh, there are exploitative behaviors on pricing, I should uh, tell you, especially in, fi in finance, but still within a range, it's permitted behavior. Which society does what makes a very big difference? I feel, in fact, the colonial venture, if you look at in the past, when um, people arrived in distant lands uh, from Portugal, from uh, the Netherlands, France, and uh, ultimately from uh, Britain in India, 
uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish in the United States, very often it is a tussle between people whose mindsets are very different. If you read some books about these early interactions between these two groups of people, what is being calculated as rational decision making by one group and what is being done by the other group can be totally different. So you can exploit the other group because on signing a contract about whether to give away the land or not, the other group is not thinking at all. Whereas you know that that's going to make a huge difference. You are deliberating on that. The other person is doing automatically. There are beautiful accounts of that where in the early stages of colonialism, there is the mind's total different categories in the human minds. So again, it's not a question of right or wrong. You wish it didn't happen. Colonialism is a dreadful thing. But it's not right or wrong. It's different mindsets have come into interaction, and they have performed differently. And now you get, even within countries, very often the primitive people, the tribes people, get exploited by the more sophisticated people, again, because of differences in mindsets. We must be aware of this if you are trying to reach out to the poor and help. Let me Again, I always do that by now. You must be used to this. I make choices about uh, how much I can present and how much I can't uh, present uh, um, of the material that I have with me. Yeah, I want to spend a little bit of time before the governance and the law. I, I will just introduce you to the topic and some of the challenges that we have at the World Bank as we go into this. But I want to tell you a little bit now about social norms and the role that social norms play a bit concretely. So I'm going to take you into game theory, very elementary game theory, but it's worthwhile. Game theory should be a part of, basic game theory should be a part of everyday life for everyone. It's just so important. So I'll give you a quick introduction to that with one or two games. This is um, the role of social norms in guiding behavior. So there are two things there are several things in the World Development Report, but there are two. One is the human irrationalities about the human mind's quirks. The other is thinking socially. We human beings think socially and collectively. There you need not be irrational, but the social collective think does lead to certain kinds of outcomes. Let me first give you a verbal account of a sort of a gaming problem. Um, which side of the road to drive on? Suppose you're in a society where there is no law about this, whether you drive on the right or drive on the left. But here you will notice something that even without a law, in this particular case, and lots of legal thinkers, there are uh, uh, legal thinkers, right, Richard McAdams, Eric Posner, and others have written on this, that there are certain practices where the law is just needed as an initial little boost. After that, it works automatically. Driving on the right or the left is a bit like that. Once a norm sets in, to drive on the right, it's actually not worthwhile for you to be the only one who violates that. This is a self-fulfilling norm. Once others are doing it, it's in your self-interest to do that. So games have this property that they can lead to collusive behavior automatically. When others are driving on the right, you drive on the right. When others are driving on the left, you drive on the, li on the left. In India, for instance, in rural India, there is absolutely no policing of which side you drive on, uh, on the road, right or left. But there is a pretty strong norm. This is not one thing on which people uh, behave contrary to the majority. You can occasionally cut and take an advantage. Again, little bits of glimpses of rational behavior. But no one thinks systematically, I'll drive on a different side from the cities. The city norm has spilt over into the villages, and everyone stays on the same side. It helps people coordinate their behavior. There are lots of examples from Václav Havel's uh, beautiful example of uh, oppression. In, he was talking of Czechoslovakia, though in this famous paper, he, essay, he never mentioned the country. He talked of a post-totalitarian state where people are oppressed, but without the hand of the oppressor ever being visible. It's my fear of what you will do to me and what you will say about me. Your fear of what the, the other way around, what I will do to you, how I might ostracize you, makes us all mimic a certain kind of behavior. You get locked into that. Beautiful descriptions of that of George Akerlof of India's caste practice. And George Akerlof makes the point that a lot of India's caste practice does not need any central policing. It's just mutual sanctioning that locks you into that. And no society is free of this risk. The McCarthy period in the United States is an excellent example 
of people pointing fingers at one another and creating a dreadful society where you're just scared that someone will call you un-American or a communist and then if someone calls you a communist and you don't call that person a communist, you may be called a communist and this sort of spreads by infection to everyone and then you begin to persecute people who get that label. So it has happened, it can happen in any society, you have to watch out for that. There are other ways in which social norms play a role in creating a better society in pulling back your selfishness from the extreme selfishness which drives a lot of the economy but it also does a lot of the harm. I want to give you one, one game which I developed some time ago and this has actually now been experimented with. Ariel Rubinstein has done a series of experiments with this game. There are others who have done laboratory experiments actually, uh, actually giving out money and seeing how people play. This game will give you an introduction to game theoretic thinking and also how norms and rationality interface with each other. So here is the, the game it is a, a complex game, but I'll tell you with a story which is very easy to remember. So you'll have no problem and you'll understand the main problem. There are two travelers who have flown in. This is called the traveler's dilemma. Let me, uh, no, I won't show that to you. You'll get confused. I might show that later. There are two travelers who have uh, flown in, let us say to Dallas airport from a Pacific Island vacation. They don't know each other. In this island, remote Pacific island, both of them bought a strange antique, identical antique they bought over there. They've arrived here and they discover that the airline has handled the uh, luggage badly and their antiques are damaged. So they make a big fuss. The airline uh, uh, um, uh, manager is called at the airport. They said, look, this is a precious antique we bought in this island and it's damaged, so we want compensation. The manager says, I'm very happy to compensate you, but I have a problem. I can't quite judge the price of this strange object. I've never seen anything like this. But since both of you bought this from the same place, paid the same price, this is the way in which I'm going to compensate you. And the compensation rule is the follows. The two of them are told to sit at two corners, not talk to each other, write down an integer, which is meant to be the dollar price of this object, anywhere from $2 to $100, any integer, two, three, four, five, up to 100. Other person also writes. Then the manager is going to pick up these two pieces of paper, look at the two numbers, and the manager tells them in advance, this is how I'm going to compensate you, that if it happens that the numbers are the same, I will assume it's, you've both been honest. But in any case, whether or not I assume, I'll give you that money. So if both of you write $50, you'll get $50. But if you write different numbers, I will treat the lower number as the true price, give both of you the lower number, but the person who wrote the higher number, I penalize by giving $2 less than that. And the person who wrote the lower number is in relative terms so good, I'll give that person $2 more to reward the relative honesty. So do you get it? The game is now very simple. If both of you write, just do a quick experiment so you have it in your head. If both of you write 92, how much will you get? 92, both of you. If one writes 90 and the other writes 95, how much will the both of you get? Sorry? Good. Thank you very much. I read my mind right. So if one writes, what did I say now? One writes 90 and the other writes 95, how much will you get? Can you see the one who wrote 90 will get 92, one who wrote 95 will get 88. Clear? So you've got the full game now in your head. Now these two players have to write down the numbers. If you use standard economic reasoning, perfect rationality and rationality being common knowledge, this is in game theory, this is very central, that not only are you rational, you know that the other person is rational and you know that the other person knows that you are rational and so on. So it's fully rational. Now you do your little bit of thinking and you're ruthlessly rational. What will happen in this game? This is actually, I'm, I'm glad I'm giving this in uh, Georgetown. This should gel in with your founding principles, how ruthless selfishness is not a good thing. So if both of them are ruthlessly selfish and rational, what will happen? The first, let's say that you think your first thought is, oh, the, the other person looks very clever. Both of us will write 100, we'll get $100 each. A lot of money, the, let's say the antique was junk. So $100 each, good money. Then it will strike you, if you're ruthlessly rational, 
actually you can do better. And can you see what you can do to do better? If the other person is writing 100, you can do better by writing 99. The other person will get 97, but you'll get 101. You know, one dollar, an ice cream or something, why not? Uh, so you are ruthlessly rational. You reach the conclusion, oh, I'll write 99 and make more. But then you look at the person and say, that fellow looks quite clever. By now, that person has reached the same conclusion, I'm sure. So she's going to write uh, 99 as well. So I'm reconciled now. We'll get 99 each, $99. Both of us write 99. But at that point, it'll strike you. One thing you can do better. Write 98, and you'll get 98 plus 200. The other person will get uh, 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 96, but you don't care. About, you're not mean or anything like that. You're just selfish. So you will move to 98. It'll strike you. The other person is doing the same reasoning is down to 98. Why not 97? Go through this reasoning and variety of game theoretic reasonings, not just this, show that the only rational way to play the traveler's dilemma is to write down two. The other person writes down two. You'll get $2 each and you go home with that. This is true of the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium of this game is writing two each. In game theory, we have something called the strict equilibrium. To write two dollars, you'll be told. There is a broader equilibrium notion called rationalizability that will predict two dollars. But experiments done by a whole host of people, including by Ariel Rubinstein, which shows that people don't do that. And again, for that, I wouldn't need experiments. You have to introspect. Would you do that? The answer is no. In fact, what you find is that most people write numbers in the 90s, usually. 92, 93, 94, 95, a whole lot. Few write 100. Very few write 2. And my belief is that the ones who write 2 simply want to signal that I've learned game theory. <laughs> uh, but because the human instinct is to be cooperative, and luckily so, uh, that that's what leads to a higher number writing. And if both of you write a higher number, you get a higher number. This leads to two thoughts which, uh, from this game. One is questioning what is the meaning of human rationality. There are some very deep puzzling questions. The other is to see the role of norms. If you are a bit respectful of the other, that say that, look, I want to make money, but I don't want to trample on the other person. Just to make an extra dollar, I don't want to rob two dollars from the other person. This little bit of regard for one another can have this society do much better. In fact, both of you could have got $100 each if you had that regard for one another. We've played, this has played very little, little role in mainstream economics. A lot of it was assumption of convenience. We assume individuals to be rational because that's a convenient, clean assumption. But bad economists forgot that that was an assumption of convenience and began to think that that is true of life. And one experiment done by my colleague Bob Frank and psychologists at Cornell showed that if you make people from different disciplinary backgrounds, law, uh, sociology, psychology, make them play games, economists play games more ruthlessly, selfishly than other uh, people from other disciplines. And my belief is not that economists are worse people. But like everyone, you want to be a normal human being. If in textbooks you've learned that that is normal behavior, you behave like that. And the World Development Report has a section where it has a, uh, a few pages on corruption where it points out that one reason why corruption is more in some society is where you believe that everyone else is corrupt. You don't want to be the sucker alone, so you also begin to be corrupt. So corruption behavior has this kind of self-enforcing uh, um, element in it. I want to let me leave it at this on um, uh, uh, society norms and the role that it plays in human functioning, in economic well-being. And turn to the next subject where, as I said, I will take actually no more than 10 minutes because I'm going to give you just some early thoughts of where we are. And this is really sufficiently early that if you get some good ideas, write to uh, us and let us know what you think we should do. I I'll tell you where. Of course, it's with a concept note that we've got into it. So let me tell you what this is about. Governance and the law is the next world development report, the one we are working on. The one which will come out this year is called Internet for Development. And actually, we are thinking of these three world development reports as parts of a trilogy. The first one is on psychology, sociology, and 
how do you deliver, how do you, the mechanism of welfare distribution, how do you do better with that? The second one is on technology and how do you better do better in terms of intervention? And the third one is on governance and how do you do better in terms of governance and the law in terms of delivery and distribution and reaching out to the people? This third one is at a very early stage and we are thinking of it this in terms of uh, this uh, trilogy. So in the end, you are thinking of governance for two purposes. That the, one of the roles of a government is to make a lot of private transaction and entrepreneurship possible. But there was a view which was fortunately it's now marginalized and gone out of the profession, which took all activities of government to be wrong. You want government to vanish and let people function on their own and trade freely and do whatever they want to do freely. We know that uh, that can lead to just dreadful inequities, injustices, and we've seen that historically. I mean, early society had very little government, had dreadful uh, practices. Government plays a very important role. One role of the government is actually to enable the private sector to function better. You have to provide a legal setting so that the private sector functions better. If there are great inequalities, this is my value judgment, you don't have to share that. If there are great inequalities, I like to believe that the government has a role in coming in and trying to correct some of those grave inequalities. You know, one's normative positions do not have to impinge on one's positive analysis. This is the old David Hume's law. My normative position is that extreme inequalities are unacceptable for themselves. You don't have to justify in other ways. We live in a world where there should be greater sharing. But whatever it is that you want the government to do, certainly you want the government to provide space for the private sector, for, the, for enterprise to function and do better. But if you also believe that the government has a responsibility to reach out to the poor for better distribution, government has some other functions. You have to tax, you have to distribute some of that tax, you have to provide health benefits, you have to provide basic education to people. There are developing countries where the tax to GDP ratio, the amount of revenue collected as tax is shockingly low. You just government collects a pitiable amount. So in these countries with huge amounts of poor, you can reach out to the poor. So how does the government do these functions better is what we will go into in this report. Somewhat ironically, uh, uh, the, some of the earliest recognitions of that the government has an important role to play for a market to function well is in the United States. Antitrust legislation, the United States has been a pioneer in antitrust legislation. The first one is 1890, the Sherman Act. Then you have the Clayton Act, 1914, Robinson Patman Act, 1936, or something like that. These acts come one after another, and they are trying to make sure that one person does not grab the entire market. And this has been a bit of a role model for the entire world. There are other things also which have been a bit of a role model. There's something called the Webb Pomerine Act, 1918 where the country realized that uh, you want to hit out at collusion so that consumers don't suffer. But when a group of industrialists are colluding to export to the rest of the world, you don't have a responsibility for those people. So the Web Pomerine Act actually allows firms to collude if you're colluding it for the export uh, market elsewhere. Virtually all country has similar exemptions. Japan has actually more a draconian exception allowing collusion when it's for another country. But today, antitrust legislation is very sophisticated in the United States, very rudimentary in developing countries. I worked in India for several years. And in India, in terms of intellectual expertise that goes into these matters, is actually very substantial. I mean, it's the people very similarly educated, involved in policy making. But if you look at India's antitrust legislation, lot to be desired and there's a great scope for improvement over there. Very often it's a knee-jerk reaction against anything big is wrong. That's not it. It's about practices and behavior patterns that you want to go after. So there's a lot to be done. This topic of uh, um, a, a governance sort of cuts across uh, and law variety of fields. How good and efficient is your government determines how your distribution system will take place. And a lot of this, what happens in, especially in developing countries where the fight for development is the most stark, our emotions get the better of our reason. I just give two examples and stop. Food distribution is crucial um, in poor countries. And I do believe that food, health, um, uh, basic education, these are areas where the government has to be involved. But involved how is critical. I'm picking this example from India. India's food distribution happens in the following fashion. 
something called the Food Corporation of India, which is a government, government of India body that collects food, buys up food for, from farmers. And there are some parts of India, like the state of Punjab, where 98% of the food grain gets picked up by the government. So government goes, opens the door, buys up the food. Then what you do, part of it you keep in storage for the rainy day, prices may rise, etc. Part of it, you distribute it back to poor people through some 500,000 stores all over India. What is done is, this food is then handed over to these store, store owners and they are told that, look, we are giving you cheap food, cheaper than the market price. Now give it to the poor people who will come with a card identifying themselves as poor at below the market price, which is stated by the government. You can see the incentive system over here. For these small shopkeepers who have been given, handed over the subsidy, now told you give it to these people, what happens very often is a part of that food is now sold on the open market at the market price. When the poor come, you tell the poor that, sorry, uh, the supplies didn't come from the government. And the poor don't even have enough voice to protest, they go away. Studies show that about 40% of the food leaks out because of the system. What should you do about it? There's one class of people who say that we should not get into the food market at all. If people suffer, they suffer. Again, my own normative stance is that's not right. Uh, food is something basic. The government has to get in on this. But you can design this better. And one simple design which will not cure everything but do it better is changing the way in which government is trying to deliver the food to the poor. But this is going to, first of all, hurt some vested interests within government and also the way in which bureaucrats have practiced things, I find that very often is a very big stumbling block. When people get used to functioning in a particular way, to change that is difficult, that gets in the way. What would do this in my uh, thinking is if instead of giving the subsidies to these shops, subsidized food, and telling the shops that now be honest and hand over the subsidy to the poor, the subsidy is given directly to the poor give them cash or food stamps or something and tell them you go and buy anywhere at the market price from the open market. Then look at the difference when a poor person goes into a store, there's nothing to distinguish between the poor person and the rich person because he or she is paying the same price because the subsidy is already with this person. This transfer of a direct subsidy, I think is going to cure a large part of the problem, but then the distribution system has to be repackaged, redone, it has to be redesigned. A lot of it is a governance problem. And my last example is something that I was very closely involved in, in India. Corruption, we do hope that in this report we will go into. Corruption is politically a difficult topic because people are sensitive to this. When corruption is high in a society, uh, there is uh, very often um, talk of how do you handle uh, uh, the problem of corruption. And again, civil society activists, I sympathize with them because I like their motivation. So a lot of non-government organizations, civil society activists will say that all you need is determination. The government thumbs its fist on the table and says no more corruption and corruption will go away. The answer is no. Corruption also involves design. Human mind is important. A lot of the corruption is, as I told you earlier, it's your belief about other people's corruption. So the psychology part is important, but the legal design is also extremely important. I had got into this topic, which got me interested in corruption. I was, as a theoretician, interested in corruption and had written papers earlier. But while in India, and this debate was raging, I saw something in India's uh, Prevention of Corruption Act 1988, which struck me as having a flaw in the design of corruption control. This is about bribery, this piece of legislation. And that, what this piece of legislation says is that if a pair of people are caught, someone giving a bribe, someone taking, uh, or whenever there is a case of bribery and uh, the case uh, comes out of this, the taking of a bribe and the giving of a bribe are equally punishable. So once a bribery has taken place, you both will uh, go to uh, jail for 12 months or fine for something that's, I forget the exact penalty, but it's the same for both. There are some sub clauses and all, but in practice, actually in India, the giver and the taker are treated the same way. But think a little bit. Again, use a bit of game theoretic reasoning over here. Now I'm introducing you to two-stage game theory. After a bribe act takes place, the taking and the giving, the person who has to give a bribe, I'm an ordinary citizen, I have to give a bribe to a a bureaucrat for something which I, the bureaucrat owes to me, it's infuriating for me. 
I hate the person who asks for a bribe. But after I've given the bribe, do you see that my interest and the bribe taker's interest are in complete unity? Both of us are interested in hiding this fact because in, under the eye of the law, both of us will be punished. It's very difficult to catch cases of bribery if you have a law where the giver and the taker are treated completely on par. So I argued, and this was my complete naivety, I had joined the Indian government a few months into the Indian government. I wrote up a paper and thought it's such a clever idea, I must post it on the website of the Ministry of Finance. <laughs> so I did that, and I was in charge of the website, so I quickly took a decision, wrote and posted it, where it said that the uh, Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 ought to be amended, whereby in the case of harassment bribes, that is bribes where you the state owes you something. You are supposed to get a driving license. You've paid your income taxes. You need a slip saying that your income taxes are cleared. So where you're being harassed. In these cases, I said that bribe giving should be treated as a legal activity. <laughs> but bribe taking should be punishable. And maybe you double up the punishment for bribe taking. And I spelt out the reason. If you do that, then the giver and the taker's interests will be divergent after the act of bribery. The giver will want to say that, look, I've paid a bribe. And that means that knowing that in advance, the taker in the first period will be more hesitant to take a bribe. This, in a nutshell, is the idea of Reinhard Zelton in two-period games, where you reason backwards and come to the first period. And it's in game theory, if you're interested, this is a sub-game perfect equilibrium. Needless to say, I'm not guilty of using any of those terms in the Ministry of Finance paper. I wrote it very, very clearly, putting forward this argument. Storm broke out, actually, over that. People said that it was an immoral argument, that I was insulting the Indian constitution, etc. So, so much so that I remember that it was a Saturday when I, in the evening, there was a television program asking me to be on it to debate this. And usually I enjoy these debates in India. It's a completely chaotic debate on television, but I used to enjoy that. But I felt I've given so much grief that I'll, uh, phoned the Prime Minister, Dr. Singh, that time, to ask him as to whether uh, I should uh, go on this debate or not. I have to say, one of the good things in India is that you have a lot of space for public engagement. Anyway, I phoned the Prime Minister. He came on the phone, and he told me that uh, I've actually seen your idea, not your paper, but reporting in papers. I don't agree with the idea that you've uh, put forward, but it's up to you whether you want to debate on television or not, because your role as an advisor is to put ideas in public space. I have to say to this date, I think this is a great quality and countries should have that where you create space for ideas to be discussed. That television debate I, I decided not to participate in, but I did participate in a lot subsequently and the economist wrote a very nice article, very supportive of the idea that I had put forward. But this got me, drew me into a lot of the corruption control debate where I've now become convinced that to control corruption, you need to act on several fronts. One is, yes, you need determination at the top. You need a government that's able to take tough decisions, carry out those decisions. But you also need human psychology. Our World Development Report, a lot of this is also the mindset. Is it worthwhile? After all, we don't pinch pockets when we travel in metro. We don't need any decision making on that. It's hardwired into us. If it could be hardwired into shopkeepers, that when you're given grain by the government, you don't even think about whether to sell it on the market or not. You just do it. That would do it. And finally, it is the governance structure. How do you structure the laws and the way in which bureaucrats intervene that you could do better? These are really, I'm giving on governance, it's more my current ideas. But I think this is a topic where we can take important lessons out to the developing country of how to do governance better. And economics, since economics ignored this subject, though there is writing on new institutional economics and others, if World Bank can play a role in bringing this to the forefront, governance and law, we will, would have played a role in a more developed and a better world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Koshik. You certainly, as you did last time, given us lots to reflect on, uh, to talk about in the time remaining. We've got about 25 minutes, and there's a, a mic. Um, is there a mic? Yes. <laughs> the lights are very bright up here. There's a, there's a mic in the center aisle, so if you'd like to pose a question, please um, come forward and do so. Pick this up.
I'll start with a question from, um, from the web. I think your last example of corruption nicely tied together the two themes of the, of the lecture, these emerging literatures that challenge some of the existing economic paradigms, one centered on norms and, and, and mind, the other on law and governance. And obviously, to explain corruption, you need both. Um, one of the questions, or actually all the questions that we got in, uh, refer here to the early part of your talk where you really went into more detail on the role of mind and culture in explaining some of these outcomes. And the questioners ask you to reflect a little bit on policy implications uh, of these new insights. So the first question that I'll read while we wait for uh, questions from the audience here is how exactly does the bank take growing evidence on mental models and humans' non-rationality and put that into practice to do better development work on the ground? So what, what some thoughts on that yeah, large I can, question? Uh, the World Development Report is still new. It's mm -hmm. come out, and the idea there was to draw on uh, research from around the world. I mean, the, uh, the bulk of it is research done by other people pulled together. And the next stage is to put this into practice. But in this case, we have actually taken some very definite steps, very early steps. We are setting up a small unit which is going to operationalize some of the ideas that are there in the World Development Report. And from this, we will also take research ideas into the field. So the plan here is not to set up separate groups of researchers going and doing independent research. That happens a lot. But these will be embedded researchers with World Bank working actually out there in the field. So there are, there's a group that is intervening by giving, let's say, credit or food or something somewhere. We will send some of these researchers trying out some of the ideas from the report alongside, collect information so that we are also updating our information and getting new research ideas and having a more effective intervention. And some of these interventions can be remarkably effective at a very small cost just by redesigning how you intervene. So the same thing, the same medicine that you're trying to give from which people are running away, you tweak it, the manner in which you give, the local leaders that you involve, you can be hugely more effective. Some of these ideas from the report through our unit, which we are about to form, uh, but we've had our uh, early conversations on this, will hopefully actually this time see a more direct operationalization than we do usually. Thank you. I think we've got the mic together now, please. First question. Okay. Hi, I'm Tasmia. I'm one of the Global Futures Fellows, and I'm a student in the uh, MIDP program at the McCourt School. So thank you for your wonderful lecture. We've been hearing a lot about mental models and social norms and how they uh, influence behavior. So one of the questions I had, Tom already asked, so I'm going to skip that. And my second question is about corruption. And it, it is, in fact, one of the biggest issues in developing countries. Um, but just to give an example from my home country, Bangladesh, and I'm sure it's the same in India, um, a lot of government officials, particularly policemen that you interact with most often, like traffic policemen, always ask for bribes and they take bribes. And in Bangladesh, just like India, both giving and taking bribes is considered illegal. So a big reason why they do this is because their salaries are so low that it's actually impossible for them, almost impossible for them to survive on that salary. So it's almost like a system that the government has in place that encourages them to take bribes. Um, and then people, because everybody's taking bribes, finds that normal as well. So how do we break out of this cycle? Because people will be not paying taxes because we're already paying bri bribes to get things done. What is the way to get out and break out of this cycle yeah. um, and change our mental models in some ways? That's, you know, so, uh the first thing on uh, the salaries and that being a driver, I have to say I disagree with that. Uh, you know, India I know uh, in some detail and Bangladesh also I have a fairly good idea. I personally don't believe that that's the primary cause because these people, the police and the uh, uh, bureaucrats, are not poor enough for the very small amounts of bribe that they will take in street corner. I think it's really a mindset problem very early. It's a mindset and a design problem. If you feel that is the normal behavior, every other, every policeman does, in some ways you're just being normal. You're, you're doing what every other policeman is doing. So, and this leads to the notion of multiple equilibria. You need to break that equilibrium. So I feel, first of all, the psychology part is important. We're just having people who are considered icons in society to speak up. For instance, film stars in Bangladesh or in India. 
if they can get up and speak up against this, I feel that can have an effect. And there are studies in this World Development Report of how what you're watching on television can begin to influence your thinking. So I feel, and leaders have a role to give a bit of a moral lecture to the people, even if that's not politically good for them, a little bit of moral lecturing I think is worthwhile from leaders and that ought to come. And that makes a difference. Number two is the design that I was talking about. In most of these crimes, Bangladesh, uh, much of the laws in Bangladesh are very similar to Indian laws. Uh, the history of the two countries, it's the same set of laws. I don't know about your corruption law, but once again, if the giving and the taking is treated on par, you will very seldom be able to correct this because as soon as the bribe act has taken place, the giver and the taker are beginning to collude on this. You may hate the police who took a bribe, but you will not tell another police person that you gave a bribe because you will get into trouble. So you have to look very carefully into the law, realize that just being passionate about removing laws good enough, not good enough. You have to redesign some of your laws and you have to work on the minds of these people. And in the end, because of my, this is my belief, I don't have any hard proof, my belief that human beings are fundamentally very similar across race, across religion, we are very similar people. It's a question of working on them, appealing to them, and in case it is their history that has made that, you try to appeal and change that. I know just appeal is again not good enough, but this is where the behavioral research is all about. We are beginning to inch towards a better understanding of what drives the mind. So I gave a long answer to your question. So we've now uh, set up a mic. Um, and, and while we wait for folks to, to line up, I, I can't resist asking a question um, about the sociology of knowledge. It, it doesn't seem, as a political scientist, maybe some of you in the room were thinking along similar lines, it doesn't seem that counterintuitive that mental models, that law and governance should shape economics, development outcomes. Why has it taken so long? for economics to, to come around to this? Is it because the existing methods didn't allow you to go deep into those questions? Is it a reflection of the nature of global economic issues uh, and the growing salience of these cultural and institutional factors? What, what's your explanation for how we got to this point? You know, um, the tendency for orthodoxy in human beings is a bit inbuilt. inbuilt. In economics, uh, the, I think the initial venture was right. You don't want to take on the gamut of society by bringing in everything at one go. And the early ideas were all done with very rational human beings, even Adam Smith. Adam Smith in other, many places is talking about the moral sentiment and other things, but when he's analyzing markets, it's rational human beings doing that. And over time, it becomes that. And that becomes a very convenient also mathematical tool. You can write up very elegant models with that. Once you get wedded to that, it takes a lot of effort to break that. You know, the fact that you need experiments in laboratories for economists to be persuaded that human beings are not always rational, to me, that's a bit of a sad statement that you need that. What is important and came out of these laboratory experiments is that a lot of these irrationalities are not just eccentric irrationalities, but systematic irrationalities. That was important. We had to wait for that. So you can make use of the knowledge of human irrationalities because it is not that anything goes. The good thing about rationality is very well defined and irrationality seems beyond that well defined thing, it's anything goes. But these laboratory experiments, the one good thing is they told us no, there are systematic problems. For instance, we have a present bias. We like the pleasurable things to happen today and the painful things to happen tomorrow, which leads to a lot of wrong decision making. These were things that arrived in the discipline later. But again, yes, there was a, a core interest and it's just like bureaucrats to change their ways. You have to lean on them, ca uh, cajole them to do that. There's a little bit of that in the profession, but now it's caught on and I think it's uh, sort of sweeping through. Excellent, please. Uh, hi, my name is Francisco Garrido. I'm a First year student at the PhD in economics program here in Georgetown. You, well, first of all, thanks for a wonderful lecture. Uh, you talked a lot about institutions and norms and uh, how they're important for development and how government plays a role in that and how it can actually change social norms to induce like a different equilibrium, more beneficial equilibrium for society. I wanted to ask, what do you think are the risks of government action in actually corroding social norms and taking a society from a good equilibria to a bad one. I'm thinking kind of in the case of Spain or Greece where you could argue that welfare state has actually uh, acted towards 
harming these beneficial social norms. There is a risk of that. There's a very serious risk of that. Once, after all, these are instruments. Uh, the, our the understanding of how through social norms and human mind you can influence that behavior. These are very powerful instruments. And so it's entirely possible for a government to put them to bad use. But as soon as you've discovered these instruments, it's like you've discovered a medicine. After, once you've discovered the medicine, you don't have a choice. Either you give it or not give it. You've got it already. So the staying away, that option is gone now because we have understood that the human mind can be influenced. So abstaining from a decision is not, not possible anymore because not to do something is also a decision now that you could have done something. But I'm glad you raised this question because ordinary citizens have to be alerted to the fact that this is like a new set of weapons in the hands of the government. And these weapons can be put to good use, medicinal use. These weapons can be put to bad use. The examples you're giving, though, I have to say, there are two ways in which you can have a bad effect on society. One is deliberate. You want to exploit these people, so you, you do something dreadful. The other is also mistakes in ideas and thoughts. After all, we are still fumbling and looking for the best ways to go about create policies. So who knows when you get a bad outcome, whether it was deliberate or not. But an awareness of this, that these are very powerful instruments. It's like new drugs being discovered is very important. We have to take that, this awareness side by side with the discovery of these new methods. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren Cork. Um, I'm a first year in the GHD master's program and also a Global Futures Fellow. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I think psychology and development is an interesting topic that until recently has been very overlooked. Um, I have a question based on my personal experience working at a school for the deaf in Ghana and seeing how social mental models prevented my students who were hearing impaired from contributing economically to their societies, but at the same time, um, the lack of development prevented any change in the social mental model. So kind of this uh, catch-22 of, of uh, a lack of economic development inhibits um, social change, but um, so, social norms can also inhibit economic development and how that can be resolved. Yeah. The catch-22 that you talk about has been written about uh, in the economics discipline. Um, Esther Duflo, um, Sendil Mulayanathan, Eldar Shafir talk about this. Is that, you know, uh, you're talking about a, a specific case of the deaf and what that does, but even for the very poor, we know that actually two things happen, is that the poor have very few opportunities. So they can't seize on the opportunity to be better off, but there is something else. By virtue of poverty, their cognitive functions are very often damaged. There's now a lot of hard evidence on this. So even when they get the opportunity, they don't manage to take the right decisions. Often they castigate the important decisions to automatic decisions. They don't give it a moment's thought. So it's a catch-22. You remain poor, that damages your cognitive powers, and that actually keeps you in poverty because you, the occasional opportunity that you get, you don't manage to take those, pick up on those opportunities and to do better. Once you have this, this kind of multiple equilibria reasoning, where it's a catch-22 is a multiple equilibria argument. I've written quite a bit about that. I know Martin has written a little bit about that, these traps. Once a society gets caught into a trap, it's good news and bad news. It's good, it's good news because you know, once you can nudge it out, the catch-22 begins to go the other way around. You take better decisions, become better off, the decisions be become even better, you quickly move to another equilibrium. But that initial nudge needs an outside intervention where the government comes in. So again, you have to understand these traps that are formed, and the state has to play a role in giving it a nudge which can take you out of this equilibrium. Easier said than done, I should warn you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Philip Petermann and I'm a second year student in the MSFS program. Um, thanks for coming uh, twice to, to do a lecture here at Georgetown. Um, you've been talking a lot about um, the governance issues and um, we, the discussion has been uh, also on corruption. Um, in a lot of developing countries, the elites are actually benefiting a lot from the system and that makes political change very difficult and the World Bank as an organization is already also very reluctant to um, to really uh, push um, for, for political change and to engage with the political elite. Um, where do you think, uh, what's the role of the World Bank in that regard or of other um, multilateral development organizations and how courageous can these organizations actually be to push elites for change? Thanks. 
Well, to this, uh, in response to this, I can just express hope that we will be courageous. Uh, because, you know, what you say about the elites in poor countries, you should understand that at one level, again, you don't want to be charitable to the group that is tolerating all this because they are benefiting, but a lot of big international corporations don't want to disturb many of these elites in poor countries because they are also benefiting from the control over there. So there is a bit of a complicity on this across the world. To that, I like to hope that organizations like this, the World Bank, which stand outside of this, will be bold enough and come up with these, pressurize and put pressure on the elites over there, on the big international deals that take place, arms deals that take place, which some of this is beneficial, you need to cut that deal. Some of this is you want to perpetuate the elite control because that gives you control into that society. So there is a huge agenda. I hope that the World Bank will be bold enough to step into this, and I like the outside world, the universities, to a play a role and put a little bit of moral pressure on us so that that helps to turn around and say that, look, we have to do because we are coming under pressure and we want to carry this out. Excellent. We have time for one more question. Hi. Uh, my name is Rusmir. I'm actually uh, a World Bank Group employee. So I'm here with some of the other folks uh, who are the organizers of the World Bank Group alumni um, from Georgetown. And you're in good hands. We have about 400 people active uh, in our group. So uh, great to see formal connections being made while we work on the alumni side as well. I work uh, at IFC in the private sector um, on, in the climate change department and a lot of what you talk today, climate issue is um, an example of the sort of the failure of, of the human mind of uh, focus on the present, um, uh, no, nobody wanting to sort of make the change. So how could we, and how can the World Bank use a lot of these ideas to continue pushing um, the agenda for climate change and making sure that the, there's an understanding of of the, the, the development economics and the and the uh, perceptions that we have to to really make a stand today and to act today. Thank you. Um, knowledge is the key to this, and here I can say even I have been guilty, so I can understand. For a very long time, I, I did not have the climate consciousness that this is an important issue growing up in India, I didn't have that consciousness. That, so a lot of it you have to understand the people in developing countries, it's not that you're being just careless and say that the next generation does not matter, but it's again something that you're not deliberately thinking about at all. It is the two things that can do this. One is the bad way in which you can begin to cure this and the other is the good way. The bad way is when things begin to deteriorate climate wise you become aware. In developing countries today, some major cities, Beijing, Delhi are examples of that, people are now aware of this and they've become aware because they can actually look up at the sky and see that, yes, this was something that we should have paid greater attention to. That's actually increased awareness in a huge way and I feel we are now into a phase where you're going to see some important action in big developing countries because the awareness has built up. Mexico City earlier was a very similar story. But you don't want to go that way because it's very expensive. After the process has started, then you begin to react to the di damage to the climate to correct that. Here it's knowledge, knowledge, and knowledge. And you have to realize that on this, it is not mendacity of the people. But very often, you don't even realize how big a challenge this is. So we have to dig up the evidence, make that available, take the, the, through workshops, through meetings, through writings, just take this out to the world. Fortunately, you see the change. This great level of activism that we've seen over the last couple of years. Today, no matter where you go, far away places, you see people have become aware of the climate. So I hope that this knowledge venture is what's going to turn around because this is in so much of our collective interest that once we are fully understand the damage that we often do, we will begin to take action against them. Thank you. Well, that's a great way to, uh, to end this lecture. It really pulls together one of the themes of the last four lectures of our collaboration, how to take these ideas out into the world, how a university and a great institution like the World Bank, the World Bank Group can work together on this important agenda. We'll continue to work together into the next semester and into years to come. Uh, I invite you all to continue to follow the evolution of the Global Futures Initiative as we turn to governance next semester, to visit our website, to participate in the dialogue there. Since this is the last of the four lectures, I want to conclude with some thanks. Uh, to all those who have helped to make this series possible, uh, to my uh, colleagues, Sarah Rutherford and Colin Steele, to the Global Futures Fellows. You heard from a couple today who've helped to organize these events and surrounding conversations, to the staff of the President's Office, to the staff uh, of the World Bank, 
Uh, I'd like to thank all those for, for making uh, this uh, collaboration so successful. I'd also like to thank you all for being here today and participating in this particular event, this particular conversation, and in conclusion, ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Basu for his wonderful presentation. Thank you.